practicing the basics or a more experienced player performing drills to improve your shot making and positional play. The Drill Partner is perfect for you. Hey, welcome to this episode of the Dog and It Show. Uh, this is Joey Ryan with Melina Mike and Mike Pinozo, and we're joined by a special guest, uh, Johan Reisink. Uh, former USA captain, former European captain. He's kind of been on both sides of this thing, and we're really so excited to have you. How's it going, Johan? I'm good. Thank you. Thank you. So kind of starting off, uh, just overall, we saw that you had a lot, of, um, a lot of posts online about the event, and that's one of the reasons that we reached out to you, tons of insight. And uh, just curious, uh, what's your thought process or why you kind of felt you needed to get all that off your chest? Well, <laughs> to be honest, uh, during the Moscone Cup and after, I'm always babbling uh, and reveling to my wife. <laughs> she said, Why do you talk to people who are interested? <laughs> she said, take that somewhere else. Get that exactly. out of here. <laughs> yeah. It's far too complicated, too much for her. So she just likes to watch pool, but doesn't like all the insights. And so. What was your general feeling with uh, the American fans this year? We were there in person, uh, but for Melina, Mike, and I, it was our first Moscone Cup, and so we didn't have anything to compare it to. But, man, that place was just rocking. Um, lots of noise, lots of excitement, tons of energy. Just curious your take on it. Well, I mean, it's always full of energy, but uh, you know, in my time, most of the times the Europeans were having the overhand, um, but this year I felt like the Americans were actually uh, uh, killing it. I mean, the audience was absolutely brilliant, and uh, I always liked to play in America because I think the audience is a little bit more knowledgeable uh, than the uh, European crowd. Uh, the European crowd is more there for the fun and for their own uh, pleasure, and the Americans are there more for the pool. So. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I definitely liked it, and I thought they were really loud this time, which was absolutely great, and probably helping Team America also. You've been associated with this event for quite some time. You know, every year it seems like your name gets brought up in, in you know, in, in one area or another. What was your first Moscone Cup like, Johan, and, and what was that experience like for you? <laughs> it was 2006, and uh, basically... Uh, it was like a, almost like a last minute decision. I called Luke, uh, two of my players, uh, Alex and Niels played in the Moscone Cup. And while they were traveling and playing international tournaments, we kind of beat the Americans a lot, also the Germans. Uh, and just didn't understand why we lost all the time. So uh, then I called Luke. Um, he asked me if I could win the Moscone Cup because we were 10 to behind them with the Europe. Uh, I said, yeah, of course, with my bluff uh, from The Hague. Uh, so, yeah, sure. And uh, um, then I I was not on the team pictures. I didn't have shirts. It was, it was like, <laughs> uh, yeah, like a really improvised thing in the beginning. Uh, but, uh, well, I mean, it was a great experience first time. Unfortunately, we were 12-10 up and uh, running for uh, the win. Um, Mika Imon at that time, 4-2 up, race to 5, 8-9 on the table. But uh, we couldn't make it. And uh, we played uh, a draw, which was incredible, uh, but still good, good fun and a good experience. Yeah. yeah, I will say that you know I was there in Rotterdam when when uh, Johan had his first turn as as, as captain, and uh, I could tell that that very first year that there was a culture change in the way the European players looked at the cup. You know, he convinced them that. Um, they weren't the underdogs. They were actually the favorites. And, and they've got to start treating themselves like that. And I remember your practice room had pictures of all of them with the trophies they had won during that year, if I, if I remember right, right? Yeah. And, uh, and it was, that was the whole culture shift in the mindset of the European players. And they didn't win that year. They tied. Uh, that was uh, <laughs> worst decision Barry Hearn ever made in the Moscone Cup was to play for a tie. He was so he was so uh, enamored with the whole Ryder Cup thing, where you know if you draw, you retain the cup and all this stuff. It was set up for a captain's pick, yeah. one game playoff, and and he blew it. 
that, right, Jill? I mean, that was, that was, it the was very soccerish, <laughs> very uh, soccerish, you know. <laughs> it was, and uh, but from that point on, uh, the European team mentality was completely different, um, and I credit Johan with with a hundred percent of that. Well, it was, it was in Rotterdam, like you said. It was an, uh, a location where probably three hundred people uh, were supposed to get in. And I remember I got like 30 tickets for free from my room to just right. give to all my friends and, and people in Holland. And uh, they were happy that there was just 300 people on the, on the audience. Uh, so how much did that change, right? Now it's a hype and uh, uh, tickets are sold out in an hour. So that's, uh, that's what I think is important because I'm a big Moscone Cup fan. It's the best, uh, best event in our sports. And I've always, you know, tried to make sure that it's competitive and that it's... Uh, that it's a hype that, that everybody wants to see it, and uh, because that's that's the only way forward for our sports. Who like, who who were the five players you had on on the European side, Johan, that first year? Uh, it was Imran, Mika, David Okaide, who was personally picked by Barry Hearn at the time, so it was his debut. Uh, Nick Vandenberg, I think, and uh, Rolf, of course, and Rolf and Thomas. We had Rolf and Thomas, so good. Well, I mean, uh, Rolf and Thomas. Mika, was uh, it Imran and Nick? Okay. If, if you had if if you had the option for playing for a tiebreaker, captain's pick, who was going to be going in there in the box that year? Every year. Listen, the first couple of years, my anchor man was Rolf. He was my uh, my field captain. Um, one of the few players I didn't have to come come down from the uh, from the stages from the audience to talk to him because you know he was okay. He was uh, doing everything correct, so then you don't need to coach. So if it would have been a captain speaker, it would have probably been him, yeah. What 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 would you credit Ralph's like longevity in the sport? Because he's still around, he's still competing, he's still battling. I mean, I see the guy travels all over the place. Yeah. Well, probably, uh, you know, that in, in Europe, he's probably the GOAT. Uh, you know, he's uh, won more than anything else, anyone else. Uh, he's been, always been such a great ambassador for the sports. He's always got time for the fans. Uh, and he always uh, behaves like a real gentleman, which I really appreciate. And I got uh, a picture with Ralph right there. So, yeah, he's got he's got time for the fans, all right. <laughs> <laughs> and listen, the funny thing about Ralph is that we are complete opposite persons, persons characters, absolutely opposite in everything. So we uh, we still connect uh, really well, and uh, he can laugh about my my stupid things, and I can laugh about his uh, uh, strange things that he has. So you know, we always had a good time, and uh, we we respected each other. And I think that he he helped me a lot in the in the first couple of years. Does does he laugh at your shoe collection? Uh, I don't think he saw my uh, shoe collection. <laughs> <laughs> So, well, Johan, getting to getting to uh, this year's Moscone Cup, yeah, uh, you had a post. Uh, well, each day you had a, a lengthy post that really got into describing kind of your thoughts from each day, and you brought up um, the Joey Tate incident from the U.S. Open and the the color of the balls. Uh, I'm not so much focused on the color of the balls, but I'm curious in terms of the United States. Are there you mentioned Joey Tate. Are there other younger players that you've seen out there that you think might be a good addition to that team? Yeah, there's a couple of them now. Um, I'm not really familiar with all the names because I haven't been on the tournaments. And uh, to be honest, when I'm at home, I'm not always watching all the tournaments. Uh, I don't really like to pay for uh, <laughs> for my live streams. <laughs> um, but for example, the guy Shane Wolford um, yeah. seemed to be a good addition. What I think is, you know, I tried in my time to bring in new kids and new 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 players. Um, we had like a, a, a group behind the first selection to uh, to try to to see who was ready or was going to be ready to play Moscone Cup uh, in the future. Um, unfortunately, that died when I uh, when I. Uh, uh, I wasn't hired anymore, um, but for me, it's uh, incredibly important. Uh, the way forward for America is to find the big talents that can actually uh, uh, play a Moscone Cup. Because let's let's be honest, right? There's like 400 to 500 thousand players in the United States, 
in the whole of uh, Europe, probably 30,000 people that play competition, maybe 40, but the numbers don't add up. So for me, if you see how much talents there are in Europe, if you look at the guys like Joshua, Victor Zelinski, uh, Sanjin Perfalanovic, uh, these guys are incredibly talented. These guys must be there in America too. There must be another Shane Verbone. There must be another Skyler. Uh, so uh, I thought it would be, it, it was very important to find these guys because that's the way forward for the future. So you found you found one in Tyler Steyer. And I remember when that pick came in, you know, I, I like Tyler a lot, but I thought you were crazy because I didn't think he was ready. <laughs> and so you picked him and he got up there and he played pretty well. Uh, but then this year, it was just a different Tyler. Now he had some questionable decision making, I think, in, in at least one of those games later in the, the event. But for most of the event, he looked like a seasoned veteran. Uh, yeah. just kind of owning the table, walking around the table with such confidence and playing well. Uh, what was it like for you to kind of see him up there performing the way he did in this event? Uh, well, after day one, uh, we chatted a little bit and I told him that I was, I was curious if he would hold up with the level that he played um, since in the, in, the, in the former or in the earlier Moscone Cups, he didn't always. I think he held up pretty well uh, until the last day. Um, it's all it's all about pressure in Moscow Cup, right? And everybody breaks at some point. Whether you're uh, Shane from Boning, whether you're Joshua, there is at some point when you put enough pressure on top players, they will break. They will make uh, either mental mistakes or technical mistakes or just wrong choices. And that's the point where you want to, you know, go at and and put that much pressure on them. And I think just America in, as a whole as a team didn't put enough pressure on uh, Team Europe for the for the more inexperienced players uh, to feel comfortable. I, I think uh, on day four, it looked like uh, Tyler didn't really look too comfortable anymore. Well, it's tough when you're 10-8 down or whatever exactly. it was, 10-7 10, 10, yeah. down, and then you got Josh sitting across from you. You know, you yeah. just see – you just see – what was it? Sky had lost to David in a heartbreaking way. You got um, Shane that went down to Jason after having it seemed like a, a ton of innings. Tyler was really in a in a really difficult spot, but it's been yeah. great to see his his evolution, you know. And you you took a risk, you know, way back when. Took a lot of you know crap online from fans, you know, talking about that pick. How tough is it to be in the position that you're in as a coach to make these decisions of, of putting these players in who you know, we didn't really know who Tyler was way back when. There's no, that's no, <laughs> that's no <laughs> difficult at all, Mike. No, no, that's what I'm paid for. That's what I'm, I'm, that's why I'm in that position because to right. make the decisions, all the people that are online talking about everything that they know is not uh, the things that I know. So uh, they are most of the times don't have the correct information, and I can understand the point of their their point of view. But they don't have the same information I have, and I just have to make decisions to make at that time make America uh, win. So, as an, am, is it, as an amateur, as an amateur coach, would you have picked Earl? No, and I wouldn't have accept, accepted him. What do you mean? Elaborate on that, Johan. Well, if 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 someone would have picked him for me, I don't know who did the picking this year, but I wouldn't have picked Earl. Um, not because of Will. I mean, uh, first of all, he played absolutely at his best mental state that I've seen him for a long time. So he really tried. Uh, the way he connected with uh, Shane was uh, remarkable. Um, but listen, if you follow pool on the highest level uh, and not only look at American pool, you can see the evolution of pool. And uh, it's just not... It's just not, um, he's just not at the level anymore that he can actually win a Moscone Cup or win more than 50% of the matches. That's not because he's a bad player, but the, the, the game evolved. There's all young, there's all young guns in nowadays in the, in, in the, look at Victor Zielinski, uh, uh, Francisco Ruiz Sanchez, these guys, young, Federer, these guys are young guy, uh, guns that, that can, Play brilliantly, and especially on the on the flick flag pool, the the the, the push outs, the, the 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 safeties, the kicks, 
they're incredibly good at these kind of shots and these kind of shots actually turn matches around uh, jumps and that's just you know it's just harder when you're 61. listen my 56 until 50 it didn't matter uh, whether i was in shape or not i put on my training suit and started running 5k no problem after 50 it didn't go that easy anymore it, <laughs> it, it, it's the next way things go when you're 61 your muscle tension is different you have all kinds of different problems uh, uh, that don't show up when you're 30. it's the same it's oh, interesting oh no interesting. They, they show up when they're 30 trust me no it's interesting <laughs> your points your points hold, taken hold though my, because hold my beer, hold my beer yeah. kids yeah <laughs> it, it's interesting because your points taken if you looked at earl in that um event there were certain matches where he came out of the gate strong and yeah. then he kind of faded and we even made the comment after i think it was day two that there just seemed to be a mental fatigue with earl where um you know mentally maybe he wasn't yeah. able to handle that type of pressure for that long well don't forget there's also a preparation period in front there's a lot of mental energy going into the team building which is incredibly hard for him anyway because he's not a real team player, uh, uh, as you know. But listen, if there's anyone in America I would put a, a statue for, it would be Earl. He's for me absolutely the GOAT. Him and Efren are the GOATs in, in pool. But he's 61 years old now. And I, I mean, I, it was lovely to see. And I understand every American wants to see him play. But it now has showed that, you know, it's, 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 it was not the correct choice, to be honest. If, if let's say he steals one, well, let's say he finishes off Jason because he's up 3-0. He was up 2-0 against Albin. Mm -hmm. You know, he him and Sky had a, had a spot early on in that doubles where they could have taken at least momentum in that match. Yeah. You know, is that mindset a little different, Johan? And I know we can talk about ifs, you know, after the fact, but if he gets you a couple, is it the right choice? Well, he didn't. Right. Right. That's fair. In in front and before the Moscone Cup, it was for me already clear that this was going to happen. It was, would be really hard for Earl to, to keep his level on a high uh, or his, his game on a high level for a longer period of time. But that's okay. I mean, it was good. It, it showed. Listen, for me, when they picked Earl, it was almost like, in my mind. Ah. Uh oh. I might have oh, lost him. Hold on. So you got to join. Yeah. Ah, so it was almost like uh, Omeric already lost. Let's put in a, a good show. Um, so the, at least uh, America will be interested in this in this Moscone Cup. That's what it felt like. And then I got some information from a place in America in the Moscone Cup saying, listen, he's the best at the practice table. So then I was curious also how it would hold up. But, you know, in the end, it didn't hold up. And you can talk about ifs. But in, in matter of fact, he only took one point out of five matches, which put a lot of pressure on the whole team, and especially on Shane from Boning, because Shane was actually his uh, his like uh, his partner when he right. played the singles. Shane was the one going into the arena, talking to him. It was obvious that Earl accepted Shane's advice and Shane's uh, presence, and he did not so much with the Tyler and Skyler. Uh, it's just uh, this, it, that's how it is. I mean. It's old school against new school, and new school is uh, the way forward. Sorry. What, what say you, Mike? No, I think, you know, I mean, all, <laughs> all, all points that we've talked about and thought about uh, from the minute Earl got picked, it was kind of one right. of those, this could work out well, this could go really bad. Um, you know, from a temperament standpoint, he was better than anybody could have expected. He yeah. was actually there. He was, he was trying – but he yep. put so much pressure on himself that the minute that he missed, his head was hanging, and 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 then mentally it was very difficult for him to get back into the match. Uh, so, and that's you know, that could have well been the case with any young player that he picked too. You know, a young player who's never been in that heat, he could have played well, and the minute he made a mistake, started getting into self doubt because he's not been in that position, or whatever. He could have it could have been the exact exact same scenario with any other player. So. Um, so Earl was, was, you know, the fifth player for team USA, um, for the foreseeable future is always going to be an experiment. Uh, whether you go with an old guy or a young guy who's never played before, you know, cause we don't have that depth of talent. And what Johan was talking about early on is you've got to develop that depth of talent 
and that means developing the young players. Um, and, and what I would ask Johan at this point is, you know, you talk about young players and, and you know, you see like a Shane Wolf or a Joey Tate or whatever. What does it take to get them to this next level besides just playing in all the events and practicing? You know, what, what is there a, uh, is there a structure that they need to follow to get to that level that a, that a Victor Zelinski is or some, or some of the European young players? Yeah. Well, first of all, look, it's only my opinion, right? So it's what it, that, that's, that's why what you're it here. Is. That's why you're here, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, it, I think it's a structural problem in the, in America. Yeah. I think uh, at this moment, um, the, the technical advice or mainstream in America is the, is the pendulum stroke. Uh, uh, and I think that will get you to a B level quite easily, uh, but you don't have the weapons to go further than that. So how is it possible again, when you see the numbers, why is there 400,000 players in America and only 40, 50 in, in, in Europe and still we produce better talents that can't be anything else than, than how uh, people are educated in pool. And I think just the education in, in, in American pool is, is just poor. Um, because, and I, I understand why, because you were always the number one country in the world. I was there in 1990 in the World Championships, eight Americans playing in 64 field, last eight were eight Americans, right? So you've been always been the standard for pool, and that doesn't give you incentives to, to progress or to innovate, to change things. And I think Europe needed to to overcome this this big distance behind. So we tried to find ways to get better and to find better technique and to find better uh, training methods. Um, uh, think about the details. And I think America didn't do that. Uh, so at this moment, I think they have to catch up on that field. So the younger players, uh, and which I saw on the junior championships, and they all want to play nine ball and they all want to have a good stroke, but some way or another they're kind of limited by uh, by how they are educated in pool, which is a shame, to be honest. It, is it more from like a, um, a a quality of effort or just the effort in general? No, I think the, the, the effort is good. I mean, there's a lot of uh, people trying, uh, trying to teach other people, but um, it's just the content of the, of the uh, effort is not uh, of the highest level. Yeah, I, I think one of the observations that I have is uh, here in the United States, there's a lot of different types of events on a lot of different types of tables. There's gambling matches. There's, you know, all types of things. Do you think that uh, plays a role in, you know, maybe Europeans being more students of the game? And yeah, uh, yeah. where is your incentive? Why? Where is your incentive to become a better player if you play APA, CSI, or whatever uh, competition, and you are a number two, and you can be in a, in a in a team, and you can actually go to Vegas and be a champion, playing pool yeah. for six months. Now suddenly you're a champion. You put this uh, this trophy on your on your uh, uh, on your closet, and suddenly you know after six months you're a champion. Why would you improve? Why would you like to become a four? Now suddenly the same thing with. The, the number one gambling game in your uh, country is one pocket. This is the same. I, if I play you, I, I can't play. You probably can play. So you play uh, like 75, something like that. So now if I become better, I need, suddenly need to make six or seven eight balls on one pocket. So where's my incentive to become better, to become a better player, if I can only er, already earn money and, and win matches by being a mediocre at best player? And these incentives are just gone. And if you go to the Euro, for example, it doesn't matter how long you play or what kind of uh, uh, training you had or uh, where you come from, you just have to win nine wrecks in the same format as everybody else. So when you play Rolf, Niels, Fed or whatever, you have to just play better than them. And if you can't, you have to train harder. And that's what happened in Europe. And I think that's lacking a little bit in America at this moment. There's no incentive to improve to the highest level, but that I, was my, yeah. I think beyond With, I think beyond incentive, there's no real structure in the U.S. Right. for improving in the proper way. Um, you know, people. You know, most of these most of these younger, even the younger players and the players who are you know in their 
thirties now, you know, it's, it's mostly self-taught they know some drills and they do some drills and they practice and they work harder and they play yeah. hours a day. But if it's not practiced with real purpose, then it's only going to get you to a certain level. Well, it's, um, it's practice. And in Europe it's training. I think that's the difference. That's, that's, yeah, the way. I mean, that's, that's a good way to put it. It's a great way to put it. Tra- practice versus training. Um, and, and you've obviously, oh, I'm, been touted around the world as one of the great trainers of young talent. So um, if you had the option of coming to the U.S., and this is just hypothetical, this is not an anti-Jeremy Jones thing at all. Uh, If you had the option of coming to the U.S. and captaining Team USA or being the head trainer for junior Team USA to develop talent, which would you prefer to do? I lost one definitely try to to develop the young players because there's so much more fun in that the Moscone Cup is like the pinnacle pool uh, I've done that been there you know that's past me uh, but as a fan of the Moscone Cup I always wanted to be close and I want to see great matches and with the format that's played now breaking format and the, the size of the pockets it's become more tense and more uh, skilled so the also the education needs to to be on a higher level and i would really love to uh, uh to educate young players like i've always done uh first of all it's great to help young players reach to their uh, reach them their ambition but it's also great to 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 accompany them in their uh, uh in their uh, r- route to adulthood you can give them good values you can give them good uh um uh tools for their next to their pool life to their personal life uh, that they can actually use to become a, a successful person you, you mentioned like changing the culture when it comes to training I'm, I'm just curious how difficult was it when you took over as the american coach um way back when to you know implement your european methods uh how much pushback did you get how much resistance did you get um how much of a pain in the ass was it dealing with those guys? First, first year, the first year was rough, right? Yeah. Well, I think I made a mistake the first year. Um, I asked Johnny Archer to be my co-captain. Uh, in the end, just before we, we finally get started, um, he dropped out. Uh, so uh, now they had all the American players had to trust me as a European coach for Team Europe. Uh, that was hard, um, so I didn't really want to push my methods all that much. Uh, and then it showed up in the matches, uh, inconsistency, important balls were missed. Uh, mentally, we were not uh, stable. We were too much involved with the crowd. Um, not a good combination of players. So there was a lot of things that went wrong the first uh, year. So the second year, I kind of made a decision not to do it again and do it completely the way I want it. It took some, uh, as you know, <laughs> Mike, it took some effort to get everybody aboard, on board. But when they did, you know, we had an absolutely amazing, successful uh, trip to uh, to the countries we went to. We played the Dream Challenge. We were, I think, 7-4 behind, 1-8-7. We won the Kremlin Cup uh, with Tyler. We went to uh, Holland to play Euro Tour. Three Americans on the last eight, Shane winning it uh, against Kachi in the finals. I five that. Down. Uh, so we had a, we had a great comeback here. Also, we played an international uh, team just before the uh, Moscone Cup. Again, seven four down, race to eight. We we beat them eight seven. So whole the whole year was like everything turned into gold, um, even when we were behind. So that was a, like a, a good mental uh, lesson also. So. The second year was much better. Everyone was much more focused. And uh, I enjoyed that, that one a lot. I think it was one of my best Moscone Cups as a coach. One of the things that I picked up on in your comments afterwards had to do with the players coming out into the arena. And that's something I didn't notice as much watching the production that I did in person. Uh, there was quite a few players that would come out, talk to the players in between racks and the coaches. And I think you made the comment that, you know, pretty much like the coach should be talking to them 
because what if they're the players are telling them something that doesn't really make sense? Can you expand on that a little? I don't want to butcher that for you, but what, can you share your thoughts on that here in this forum? Well, that's what you, you're there for. I mean, as a coach, you're not a trainer, you're a coach. You're responsible for the characters. You're responsible for the, the team uh, atmosphere. You're res- uh, responsible for the information that comes to the, the players. And um, I just don't think that players always know exactly what's best for them or their teammates. So it might give some, some bad, I don't know. You know, if someone is completely in the zone, like Joshua, he was really in a good zone, and then suddenly these players come in and they start talking to him, in, and you can actually see that he has to shift his focus to these players, and now suddenly he's out of focus and he has a bad, bad break, for example. Things like that annoy me a lot because, you know, that's the one thing I, I immediately got rid of uh, when I did it in 2006. That is, there were, there were always non playing captains, and that didn't work. So I thought if you have a professional coach that knows what he's doing, then uh, he can actually take care of that part, and the players only need to be ready for the for the for the games. It it it, it occurred to me that when uh, all the interviews before the Moscone Cup and when they cut out in the team match, that Team Europe seemed to be all about having fun and laughter. And if you look at the break again or the lag, uh, Joshua against uh, Shane. Joshua came up like two two diamonds short, and if you then see him sitting in his chair, he's he's really laughing and joking about it. And uh, Shane was in complete focus. Uh, so for me, that was already a sign that there's something wrong. And on the day one, losing three uh, one team uh, team Europe, I mean that that could have gone really wrong uh, because that that puts pressure on you from day one. And that's where you don't want to you you don't want to chase the score, you know. You want to be dominant, especially when you have such such good players. And uh, I just thought um, it was not the, the best mindset to start with. And then if the coach doesn't come in all the time, but the players come in, I don't think it's easy to correct it. So the players can't really correct it. That is uh, part of the of that's the job of the coach. So I think Alex had a hard time on day day one in the evening and day two and three to get it uh, in the right way again. Do you really think we should get rid of the fans choice match? Yeah, it hurt my heart a little bit <laughs> because you know, it, you're balancing, you're a balancing the, you know, the show aspect of it with right. the actual pool. And I can see both sides of it for generating interest and getting more fans excited about it. But then this year, Obviously, you knew we knew going in, although it did surprise us the European doubles pick. Um, yeah. but we knew the singles picks and and we knew you know Shane and, and Sky for the doubles on the US side. But tell us a little more about that. Well, first of all, you gotta trust match room that they that they actually the do a <laughs> I mean we don't know, do we? <laughs> I mean I trust match room to do to do uh, an honest vote, but uh, it was something that was introduced to get the American audience, especially, more involved in the, in the Moscone Cup. And I, if I look at this Moscone Cup this year, I think that the crowd nowadays is more than evolved enough. Involved enough. So I don't think it it still uh, serves the purpose that it was uh, brought in for. Uh, and then, like I said in my column, it's just terrible as a as a coach that you cannot like three day one you're three one up now you want to put some momentum yeah you don't right. want to set you don't want to set earl out there on day two to start off the day no to be honest no you would like to put uh, pressure on them uh, from from and it, now you're losing the first match i mean it's it it's not in uh, certainty before but it was very likely uh, and then the second match, and suddenly you're three three again, and it's only uh, because Skyler played an cr- incredible match on the last one that you're still on four four. But wouldn't you like to be six two ahead or or, or five two five three something like that? That would have been so much better. Yeah, I agree. Uh, it, it, it's it's a uh, it seemed okay in theory the first couple of years because they always yeah. ended up being. Really good head-to-head matches. It was Josh and Shane or Jason and Shane. They were good. They were good matches, but it still took control away from the captain. And then this year, 
to me, it, it really showed the flaw in the system because the the uh, the fans, you know, they wanted to see Earl, right? Well, yeah. I'm sorry, but if you're the USA captain, you did not want to see Earl out there against Jason, the first man. Not if you want to win. It's like well, he picked they, basically, they basically took the match away from you. They pitted your, you know, and 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 pardon the, the, the jargon, but your worst player against their best player. Right, you're you're number five against their number one. Okay, that's that's not the way. You know, that, that's, that's just wrong, uh, and it showed this year how bad that can skew things from a captain's ability to to set up his lineup. Yeah, but because look look at all the other matches. If you continue on that line, imagine you would have won that one. You would have played a six seven seven on the last day. Uh, instead of eight six behind and it's so it's such a different mindset yeah also because if you're eight six down as you know mike you don't have a lot of options in the in the singles lineup oh you have to front load yeah of course otherwise you know what uses to put chain chain and it's kind of the last two uh two matches if you right. don't play so right. then you, your options are gone for the for the singles which makes it predictable for the other coach Alex in this case, and he can put his lineup because he knows who's coming out first. So now suddenly Team Europe is in an advantage where on 7-7, it would have been like a free option. What am I going to do as a coach? So that that's it, it, it all is a result of this uh, uh, fence choice, in my opinion. What, what were your thoughts when you saw Earl on day two and three out of the first four? Now, I know number one, like we talked about, he didn't have any choice in, but when you saw him in those other two matches to start off day two, what were you thinking? Well, I mean, you always hope for the best because listen, it's, it's not good and not nice to see a ghost talk like that. Right? But it, it will be the same like the Chicago Bulls now would put uh, Michael Jordan back in because, you know, he was such a great player. He's, he's now at an age that he can't play that well anymore. And we all looking at, at Earl in his prime and, and that's how good a player he is in our minds. But at this moment, he's 61 years old. You can't go around it. So, no, I would not have liked to be in that position. And that's why I said in the beginning, I would not have accepted uh, Earl uh, or, or picked him because it's just you don't want that liability in your team that someone can actually you know, come out and just not play good. You when, want everybody to be maximum prepared. When you, were the, when you were the American or European coach, how much – how much true say did you have and who was on your team? Yeah, that's a, that's a funny, funny story, actually. In Team Europe, I never once had one pick. Uh, I, I was never able to pick anyone. A guy like Torsten Homan has been regard, disregarded by Matchroom, uh, probably because of his bad record before in the Moscone Cup. But he won at some time, he won the straight two championships. He won the Japan Open in one year. He wasn't picked. And in my opinion, at that year, he would should have been picked, but I had no choice. I just, what Barry Ledley or uh, Luke actually told me, he says, this is your five players. If you're such a good coach, you make them play well. That was basically the philosophy back then. Yeah. Wow. That's... And in the Team USA uh, time, I did have uh, kind of a free pick. So yeah. that was a much better uh, for me. <laughs> Yeah, well, at that point, they were really – they were doing whatever they could to help Team USA be the best that it could be to try to win, you know, to, 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 end, the, to end the dry spell. Uh, that's why you got the whole what – what Billy referred to as the Gucci treatment in, in, uh, in There's London. <laughs> let's look at that. Well, to be honest, Mike, there wasn't also – there wasn't a really re representable uh, uh, rankings either. The rankings were from ten right. from ten foot tables, from all kinds of tournaments that really didn't matter. So, well, how do what you do you like the rankings now? Yeah, how do you like this new ranking system with the three that qualify and then the two wild cards? Well, I'm okay with that. That's uh, you know, it gives the captains a little bit of a leeway uh, and a possibility to put something uh, surprising in or or something that. Um, that balances out the team. It's not always about the quality of the player. It's also about the balance of the team. If you have five uh, macho guys like big egos, 
that doesn't work. So you also want to have some softer characters in sometimes. So if you have an option as a captain, you can balance out your team more uh, and uh, three picks from the rankings. I think the rankings are much better and more rep representable now than it was uh, in my time. So from that standpoint, do you think that Alex was justified in picking David? Alex is justified to pick anyone he likes. Yeah. And, and it, his choice is not this. And he doesn't make choices just because he likes David. He makes choices. He's a coach like me, right? He, he understands how things work. And uh, so he probably, there was a reason for him to, to take David. And I understand that. Uh, I was more surprised about Jason, although he's a, like a real thing uh, in the Moscone Cup. But until uh, the picking uh, of him, he had not really played that well that year. Uh, right. Just after that, he won the International Open, which gave him, a, you know, like a, a reward for uh, for for his picking. Uh, but until then, he was not really the, the the best pick in my eyes. Um, but hey, that's uh, again, it's it's Alex's choice and and it's Jeremy's choice, and you know, I I I I have nothing to do with it. And uh, I like you, I'm a fan, I'm an observer, and I don't really have anything to say about it, but. Uh, Yes, when we had when we had Alex on, he made note of of how incredible Feder is. You you've obviously been a big part of of his successes over the years. What's his work ethic like that people maybe don't know about? And um, <coughs> how involved are you? Let's say today um, when it comes to training Feder. Well, I'm involved with every player that I practice with. Um, you know, if they're highly motivated and uh, and I've worked with them for some time. These people become part of your life. They become part of your family. They've been in my house. They've been. I've been in their house. So you never, you know, there's always a weak spot in my heart for people that I work with. Um, uh, Federer is just a, he's just an amazing talent, um, especially mentally. Technically, he's, he's very solid, very good. Uh, but mentally, it seems to, from a young age on, Pressure did, didn't seem to bother him that much. He was very good at, uh, you know, just doing his thing at the table, whoever he played in what, whatever situation he played. So uh, I think the mental side of him is uh, is absolutely uh, incredible. Uh, and, and, and of course, he's talented, but everybody in the top is talented. So, what, Was there ever a moment where you thought this kid could be something special? I mean, there's a ton of really talented European players, a, a bunch of them. Federer's yeah. different. You know, was there was there one moment where you kind of, the light bulb kind of went off for you? Um, probably when we went to the Derby City Classic, I think he was 16 or 17, and he got to the 11th round in Bank Pool and the 12th round in one pocket. And that's, I mean, that for a 16, I mean, we all know that the knowledge behind one pocket and bank pool is so much higher than just nine ball. Nine ball is a dumb game. It's an execution game. So you can you, you can actually do that on a very young age. When you're 12, 13, you're very talented. You can run nine ball tables. But one pocket is a different animal. And same with bank pool. And when he got that far on a young age, I understood that his, his knowledge and his understanding of the game and, and his technique and tactics are so much better than most, uh, than most players, yes. Yeah. We, we we had Alex on after the David pick was announced, and one of the things that he mentioned was the fact that during that during that phase when he's picking players, you had reached out to him, um, wanted to know more or less if Feder was going to make the team to work on some aspects of Feder's game. Um, I'm curious your your response to to that from from Alex. What he said in the podcast. Yeah, it was yeah. something to the effect of, um, you know. During that time, you know, it was a lot of input being made, and that you had reached out to him saying that there was certain that there was some whether it was Feder stroke or or otherwise that you needed to work on and needed time to prepare, and you wanted a heads up whether or not he was going to be making the team or not. And the intimation, the in intimation was that that you know Feder needed work on his game. Well, first of all, I mean, uh, listen, I've I've talked to Alex already about this, uh, and we. Uh, we we've agreed to let leave it as it was at that moment. Um, so sure. uh, that's one thing uh, I'm not going to comment on further. Uh, for me, Feder was the obvious choice. For him, not. And that's uh, how it is. 
now now that he's not the European captain, or even if he was, I mean, do, do you have any interest at all returning back to that role if Matchroom were to offer it to you, whether it be in the American coach or the European coach? Well, listen, they can't that, afford that, me. That smile says a lot, they can't by the way. Me. Yeah. <laughs> now, listen, uh, Mike, when it was 10 2 down for Europe, Matchroom basically came to me and said, listen, nobody's interested. Can you make it interesting again? and impl implementing a structure and implementing the things that we did uh, made it uh, made it interesting again to a point that actually Europe became too dominant. Uh, then they called me for Team U uh, USA and I did my job there. Uh, I think nowadays it's a much more competitive uh, event than it was a couple of years ago. Uh, I enjoyed this one also, uh, you know, in the end, Skyler is up 3-1. It's supposed to make 4-1 to make it 8-8. So it was really tense. It was really tight. Um, I enjoy it. Uh, I enjoy the competitiveness of it. I enjoy the fact that this time, again, America looked like a real sports team. They looked like they bonded well. They looked like they had a good preparation and they were a real team, which I, I think is the most important part, uh, that they showed themselves as good rep representatives of the sport. Uh, so I think my 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 job is done there. I don't need to do that again. I don't want to work in circles. I'm 56 years old. I don't have the same energy as I had uh, 15 years ago. So for me, it's okay. It, it goes okay the way it goes now. So no, I'm not really interested in coming back to the Moscone Cup. <clears throat> Johan, one of the reasons that uh, we really started this podcast, you know, we're just a group of guys that were sitting around during the pandemic. But we had this dream of, well, pool could be bigger, right? And could we play a small part in it? And for a while there, I was thinking, you know, could it be bigger? You know, how big could it be? And then I I see what Matchroom's done in the last several years. I see what Predator's doing with their events. And we go to Moscone Cup, and there's 2,500 people in there. And for the first time, it was that moment where I do have hope. I think this could grow into something huge. And uh, Pinozo interviewed Barry Hearn. And I mean, I'd go to war with that guy. Like he was just really inspiring about his plans, his vision for the future. And and I'm curious to get your take. Uh, you know, Emily was just on 60 Minutes on that special with Shane Van Boning talking about, you know, seeing these players make a million dollars. What future do you see for pool in terms of earnings and, and really growing this and getting back on mainstream television, that kind of thing? Well, first of all, you said uh, that gave me hope. The game has always given me hope because this game is incredible. You can't find a kid and bring him to a pool table and doesn't like the game. There's, there's enough interest and enough... Uh, a ve um, value in this sport to have hope. The problem is that, or the way I see it, is a problem that we were not and still not uh, structurally organized very well at the top. The WPBA, uh, the WCBS, all these uh, organizations don't seem to really um, uh, have the, the the good things or the 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 That's interesting. The, the the benefit for the sport in their minds. So, um, Predator, uh, Meshroom, they are doing a good job in at least making some structural changes, bringing uh, uh, events with good prize money. But it's, <laughs> it's still, it's, it's always going to be a very hard sport to earn your money in. Uh, since there is no outside sponsors, there's no Coca-Cola, McDonald's, Nike involved. And until that time, uh, it's all about... Uh, uh, you know, individual uh, incentives like Predator, like Matchroom to uh, to grow the sport. When there's one of these big guys coming in, then we can actually go to uh, to a worldwide, uh, a very respectable sport. Now that Alex is not the coach for Team Europe, what would be your, if you had a, sh a short list of players and or traditional coaches slash trainers who might fit the bill well for team europe who would be on that short list 
No, I have absolutely no idea. I mean, if you take players, ex-players like Darren or Niels, Mika, Rolf, uh, you know, these guys have played Moscone Cups. Do they know? They know how it works. They know how to do a lineup. Do they know exactly how to coach? I don't know. Uh, but I think since there's no one on the American side with the same uh, the same credentials, I don't think that is all that it matters all that much. Maybe you would like to bring in a good name that you know that only adds to the to the flavor of the Moscone Cup. Like if you put a good name, uh, like a, an ex-player, former player like Mika or Rolf or and, and Niels in as a captain, you know that gives a little bit of extra information and a little bit of extra uh, juice on uh, on the Moscone Cup. But uh, for for me, uh, I don't really have a short list. I don't think about these things. I just think about uh, that my name comes up and then I, I'm, said, I'm I'm laughing and I think, okay, uh, but that's done, uh, not me. <laughs> that's fine. So, so do, you well think do, that the, do you think that the? I'm sorry, Mike. Do you think no, that no, the no. Um, the teams would be best served then by having traditional coaches slash trainers? Um, when they are behind, yes. So Team America at this moment <laughs> has a definite need for a, for a guy like that. Uh, when you're in front, uh, like Team Europe is now, uh, not so much because you know they 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 obviously have the 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 bigger pond of players that they can choose from. Uh, they have the better quality probably on average in the best five players. So the 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 need is now for America to find a guy that actually uh, make them can make them win again. How coachable were the Americans when you first came on board, and how and and where do you see them at now? Well, they are, they were very coachable, uh, not for first year, but the second year they were, because then they also felt that I was really involved, uh, so and I was really committed, uh, so that was good. Um, I I always think it's 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 funny or strange, you know, when I've done I've done two Moscone Cups and. There was a reason for us to win. I worked with Skylar, with with uh, Shane, with Tyler, all separately, Billy. Uh, and for me, it's just amazing to show them what is needed to win, and then see them uh, like three months later on, on a different tournament and doing not the things that make them win, the things that we we talked about and that we went through. It seems that players forget uh, to learn from winning sometimes. It seems that a lot of players like to learn from uh, when they lose. And remember, after, after every tournament, if you go with 256 players, 255 go home with a loss as their last yeah. match. Right. Can, can you give us an example of that, Johan? I'm really curious about that. So you're saying that, that you talked with them and trained them a certain way, and then later you would see, without mentioning names, but later you would see them do things opposite or different than what you coached them? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, things that that we talked about that they don't use anymore, tools, mental skills, uh, technical skills that seemingly they lose uh, again if you're not uh, there uh, all the time. It, 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 maybe that's that's logical. I don't know, but it it seems to me again you can lose in a thousand ways, but you can only win in a couple of ways. When Did I you see that? Do you see that with with, America, with Europeans? Sorry. Yeah, Go well, I mean, yeah. In 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 general, they are more uh, they are more about the process and less about the result. So uh, so when it it just uh, uh, well anyway that that's that's okay. I don't I don't want to you know elaborate too much. But uh, uh, for me, it was just amazing to see that uh, if you you can you can lose in a thousand times, you can win on uh, ten ten different ways. But if you don't can't uh, learn from the way to win, you know you can lose in a thousand ways. So now you learn that how to not lose. Now you can use the other nine hundred ninety-nine ways to lose. You need to learn how to win. Getting into the winner circle is difficult, and to stay there is even more difficult. But then you gotta do the things correct, the right process, the things that helped you to win. You gotta maintain them and uh, and nurture nurture them. How did you get into all this, Johan? How did you get into coaching? players training them uh well probably because i was the first in in holland uh, that actually played the uh, european championships 
Uh, then I filmed in 1990, I filmed the, so we had a professional film crew to film the uh, first World Championships in Bergheim. Gave me a lot of information and then suddenly I was like the authority in Holland uh, by a pool because we, we were still scooping the balls to jump. We didn't know. <laughs> Is that right? You can't do that. We were, <laughs> we were, we were clueless. So but then suddenly I found some information and people started asking me and you know, after a couple of years, I found it more interesting to talk, teach other people how to play than play myself. Because playing yourself means you have, you have to train eight to ten hours a day, which is not uh, for everyone and definitely not for me. Yeah. You, so had like, very, you had very structured, formal training and coaching through the Dutch uh, Olympic training uh, procedure, mm -hmm. correct? Yes, yes, yes. What was that all about? Well, yeah. Uh, in Holland, we have this uh, level four coaching, which is the highest level in your own sports. And then they have this uh, uh, education for top coach five, which means that you can actually uh, work in any any sports because the structure of sports, both in trainings and, and in preparation, etc., is, is basically the same. They use the same uh, uh, systems, the same uh, methods, only the content is different because every sport is different, of course. Uh, so I learned it in this two-year uh, education, I learned how that works, how these, uh, these general structures in top sports work, and I was able to implement them into pool. Uh, I was always, I was never a big fan of reading pool books because every pool book says the same, basically, and the real information doesn't come from pool because we are still very poor uh, sports as information goes. We don't have a lot of uh, research about acceleration of the queue, about stance, about whatever. There's no scientific approach to pool. It's all uh, anecdotes and experience from players in the past that is, uh, um, you know, brought over to the next generation. But the scientific approach nowadays is 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 basically done in average sports because, you know, it's so important now. Uh, price money gets higher, there's more exposure for top sports, so everyone gets more scientific about it. Um, look at the shoes that Nike brought for the marathon. So suddenly the times in marathon goes down three, four minutes. Uh, so these things, these scientific developments should be there in any sports and, and pool just kind of lacks them, uh, lacked them. Uh, and that's why I was really happy that the Olympic Committee uh, uh, you know, educated me with all this knowledge. Absolutely perfect, yes. Yeah. Whether it's Jeremy or someone else next year for Team, Team USA, if you could give them only just one piece of advice um, to help Team USA next year, what piece of advice would that be? Well, uh, wow. What kind of advice? Don't be girl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, again, I was happy with the uh, with the way it went. Uh, it looked really quiet, relaxed, and uh, professional in the Team USA side. So uh, continue with that, um, and just you know, a little bit more maybe on the mental side. Uh, the mistakes that were made uh, were very, very, very important mistakes at very delicate moments. Uh, so, you know, it's good to, to have like alarm bells uh, to understand when the situation needs to be correct, when you need to put your foot down. And uh, America did it for three days, uh, two and a half days, and then, uh, then it kind of disappeared. So maybe a little bit more on the mental side to be a little bit stronger mentally. Uh, but for the rest, I was pretty okay with it. And I think uh, if they continue this way, that it will definitely... Uh, Come back to uh, the United States uh, this cup, yeah. What's your What's your schedule looking like in the next few months, Johan? Oh, that's going to be. Uh, <laughs> I don't think you want to know, but I'm traveling all around, and I'm working on a, a different project now. Uh, so when I come home in uh, end of January, uh, then I will work on the project again because I want to do something that will kind of uh, surprise the whole pool world. I'm not going to talk about it too much, but uh, it's going to be a, a real uh, ambitious project uh, for every buyer, every pool player in the world. So. You got to break it on this show when it's ready, yeah, when it's yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll have you gotta, back. We'll we help you promote it. Yeah, and speaking of which, guys, check out Johan's Instagram at Johan Rising Official. Um, 
you know, I'm sure there's a lot of great stuff on there. And, uh, Johan, this has been great. We've been on for an hour and we really, yeah. And we've had tons of comments. I wish we could have got to all the comments that were in there. Um, but you know, there was just a limited amount of time. So we appreciate you taking the time to talk to us, your insights. I mean, this has been one of my favorite interviews. So thank you so much for coming on and we'll have to get you back on sometime if you're up to it. Yeah, yeah, no problem. We love that. Just, I, I got to know, do you still have the film from Bergheim? No. No. God, I, would is, love, I would love it, to see that. It is somewhere here in Holland. Uh, there's a couple of people who have it. It's still on this VHS tape. So we, we, if I find one, I will definitely translate it to a DVD or something. Because yeah, it's it would here. be fantastic. Yeah. yeah, old school, 32 years ago. Earl Strickland in his prime, yeah, running at running nine prime. and taking 32 seconds. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Johan, we appreciate it. And um, yeah, thanks a lot, man. It's been fun. Okay, you're welcome. Great seeing you.